Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hey Lane. Hello. And we are so happy today to have our sidekick back, Dave Dowling. Hey Dave. Hi Lisa and Lane, how you doing? Hi. We are doing so good and we're kind of talking about something really different for us today. Um, Lane picked a topic that's, you know, a little uh, out of our ordinary and that makes it kind of exciting. And I can't wait to hear what exactly we're going to be talking about, but we're talking about some starting a few perennials from seed. Is that right? That is correct. We're going to talk about three perennials you can start from seed. You don't necessarily have to start them from seed, but it is an option. And Dave is going to walk us through the whole process and some different varieties, how to space them, how to harvest, just tips and tricks that he's gathered over the years. And that's just so perfect because, um, you know, Dave is one of our instructors for Flower Farm and School Online. His course's name is perennials, bulbs, woodies, and more. And this kind of just fits right in. He is the walking encyclopedia is our nickname for Dave because Dave knows all. He has so much experience here. So take it away, Lane. All right. Well, before we get started, I do have an important little announcement here. So in our eucalyptus episode with Dave, I mentioned at the beginning that there were going to be some koalas joining us. And when Anne from our team heard that the koalas didn't end up showing up. She actually took the initiative to send me (laughs) a stuffed koala (laughs) so that we, I could make all of our dreams come true. So very good. (laughs) And this is a great place lane for us to say, if you're listening to this on a podcast, you need to head on over to YouTube and catch a peek at that cute koala. You do. And the next thing is we need to think of what to name it. I'm open to suggestions. So (laughs) they can make suggestions to name the koala on the uh, YouTube page in the comments. Perfect. Yes. Everyone go to the YouTube page and tell us what to name this sweet little koala bear. (laughs) That is all right. So I'm really excited about this topic. I grow so many perennials from seed, as I think a lot of you know, because I've mentioned it before, and I'm excited to get started. So, Dave, could you just give everyone a little background again about yourself? Okay, yeah, sure. My name is Dave Dowling. I had a cut flower farm in Maryland for about 20 years back in the late 1900s, it was, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then I closed the farm and went to work for Edney Flower Bulbs. And then that got bought by Glockner, where then I could sell seeds, plugs, all kinds of stuff. And then in 2020, late 2020, uh, Glockner sold a ball seed, which is part of the uh, big company that supplies the whole country with plugs and seeds and all kinds of stuff. So now I'm basically a sales rep to cut flower growers selling the items that Ball sells, um, perennials, plugs, seeds, all that kind of stuff. Um, I did the class, like Lisa mentioned a little while ago, I did the class with the Gardener's Workshop, past president of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, the ASCFG, which if you're a serious doing it for a profit cut flower farmer, you really should be a member of that organization. Um, and then I do these kinds of webinars and things with you guys. Keeps yes. me busy. Yes. And I will also say that all the perennials we're going to talk about today, they're hardy to either zone three or four. We'll make sure to list the hardiness for each one, but they're very hardy. And Dave also said that there are no special seed starting treatments like stratifications or anything that are required. So you should just be able to start them in the standard way and have really great results. All right, so let's get started. So first up, we are going to have echinacea. I love echinacea so much. These are daisy-like flowers. They have a really prominent cone in the center. Dave, why is echinacea worth growing? Well, it's a great flower because the the common name is purple cone flower, which it was never anything purple. It was kind of a a pinkish, (laughs) uh, not purple. Um, But it's not just purple anymore. There's yellows, orange, gold, reds, so many different colors that they've hybridized over the years. Um, so it's a, gives you a wide, uh, color range. And then also to mention the center cone, which is the seed pod in the center, you can use that just as a texture where, whether you didn't pick it in time, the petals have gone bad or an insect has come and eaten your petals. You can yeah. pluck off the petals. So use the center cone, um, either fresh or it can also be dried and it kind of a gold tone when it's fresh, it dries a little darker brown. So you kind of have a, a multi-use of the flower. Um, they're long lasting. And it makes a great garden flower and easy to grow as a cut flower. 
Yes. And what you said about using just the cones alone, that's also just true in the landscape. Even once the petals have fallen, it still adds so much interest if you're just leaving it up just for those cones. Right. It always the empty the dead flowers, so to speak, over the fall and the winter is great for birds. Yes. Old fish seeds. And in the winter, if you get the snow on them, it just looks really nice in the garden. Even though it's this dead plant in a seed pod, you can leave it there all winter and just clean it up in the spring. Or you're going to cut and sell them all. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the landscape designer Pete Aldolf uses echinacea a lot in his designs, and he definitely intends for them to be left up when they're in that cone stage. Yeah. Lisa, did you grow echinacea or do you I grow did. echinacea? I, I did back in the day when we grew a lot of perennials, and um, that's exactly how we used the majority of them, because we would get damage on the petals from cucumber beetles, which you holes in them, and I just plucked those petals off and made yeah. it this awesome little cone in the middle, um, and I loved selling them when they were really fresh, when they're kind of that real orangey oh. kind of burnt oh. color, um, so yeah, and we found that um, they were strong growers, you know, that they would reseed as well as return the next year. Um, so yeah, echinacea. Um, I will say that the standard that, right, I'm agreeing with you, Dave, whoever saw purple coneflower? I mean, I never, they're like faded pink. And yeah. for us, when people saw them when they were in bloom, they thought it looked like an old flower, you know, because the petals were pointing downward. So that's what led me also to just pluck those petals off because the middle was the cone is what really became significant to us. I was going to say some of the, most of the newer varieties, the petals don't droop down like the flowers wilting. They're very horizontal and like oh, a well, daisy. That's good to know. Yeah. I'll hang down so they don't look like they're getting old or wilting. The way you can hold a coneflower plant is, it's the cone in the middle when it's, when it's short, that's the fresh flower because it's really cone shaped. It's the flower's getting old and it's making seeds, so it's gotten taller. So if the central cone is short, it's a fresh flower. If it's really tall, it might be better to pick off the petals because it's not going to last very long as a cut flower, but the center cone would be fine. Awesome. That is so interesting. So what are your favorite varieties, Dave? And I know there are so many varieties of echinacea, but are there any that come to mind that are particularly interesting to you right now? There's lots of varieties. There's um, a newer variety, newer series or a new variety. It's called Cheyenne Spirit. And it's actually a whole bunch of different colors. There's like a creamy white, there's bright yellow, orange, um, kind of a, a rusty red, all in the same pack of seeds. It's always a mix. It's not sold individually, but it gives you a nice range of lots of different colors to sell. So you're not stuck with, you know, planting 50 plants of what was called purple and it was really pink or just red or orange. You get a good color range by growing that mix. And it is available from seed. Um, so you can start from seed or you can also, if you don't want to start the seed and just want that variety, you can always buy plugs for it. And is that variety first year flowering? And can you talk about what that means? Yeah. First, first year flowering is when uh, a perennial plant started from seed, say this spring is going to bloom this summer. That's called first year flowering because there's a lot of perennials and we'll talk about one of them later that doesn't bloom until the second year. So you don't want to be disappointed and think, okay, I'm going to plant these seeds in March or whatever in the spring and then they don't bloom all summer. You think, what did I do wrong? We didn't do anything wrong. That's just a variety that doesn't bloom the first year whereas echinaceas do bloom the first year or what they call first year flowering. You can plant it in the spring, you, know, you have flowers. If like the echinacea, you start the seed in March or April, um, maybe even early May, you'll have flowers in late July of that Great. same year. All right, Dave. So what hardiness zones can grow echinacea as a perennial? Uh, most echinaceas are perennial of zones four to nine. So then take a pretty good cold winter. Um, but like with most perennials, they have to have good drainage because nothing's worse than sitting in water or what turns into ice in the middle of the winter, that's what's going to kill them. As long as you have good drainage, they should be fine in zone four to zone nine. Perfect. And what spacing do you recommend out in the field? And are there any other special tips for growing echinacea? Um, the echinacea gets to be about 12 inches across because the stems do grow straight up. Um, and it does stay as a clump. It doesn't run, send up runners like some perennials do. It stays as a clump, just puts up more stems every year. So about 12 inch spacing is good. You can go a little bit more, maybe 15 if you wanted a little more space. Um, you could do a single row, but I would recommend doing a bed. We have a double row and it's like 12 to 15 inches between the two rows and the plants are staggered down the row. And then, then 12 to 15 inches between the plants. Perfect. Is that similar to how you grew it, Lisa, when you were growing echinacea? Yes, and we did the zigzag as Dave was doing, but I actually think I put three rows in a bed, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. 
And, you know, uh, back then my beds were wider. So I think I did. But yeah, it worked really, really well. And we mulched them and they did great. And were you yeah. growing them as perennials, Lisa, or did you do first year flowering varieties and plant every year? We grew perennials as perennials. Yeah. Lisa mentioned you using mulch. That's great because you definitely want to make sure that in any perennial area, growing area, that you have weed control pre-planned. <laughs> you don't want to go back yeah. to August rid of the weeds. Um, echinacea, because it does grow as a kind of a clump where all the stems come from the same spot every year, you can do the mulch. It could be grown in landscape fabric, um, good compost, anything. But it's it's one of those perennials that works with landscape fabric because the plants stay in that one circle that you made in the plastic or in the landscape Perfect. fabric. And what is the proper harvest stage if you want to use it as a flower for a cut flower? You already mentioned about the cones, but you can also touch on that again too. You want to pick them as soon as they open. Um, like Lisa mentioned, I mentioned insects are like them. They're going to come and get them if you leave them out for too long. So you want to be harvesting them the day they open. It's not quite like a sunflower where it can be still closed. You want it to be totally open, but that day it opens totally, you want to pick it that day. And then you can put in a cooler like any flower. They're good for a week in the cooler and should have about a week vase life once they're in the house. Great. And do they dry well? I know that just the seed heads alone, but do they dry well as a flower? The petals would. No, the individual petals will shrivel up and get kind of wrinkly looking. Some people have dried them. I've seen it. It just doesn't look that good. But the center cones dry amazingly well. Like I said, they do just turn darker, but they do dry really well. Yes. And Lisa, did you sell those cones to florist customers or was that just something you would add into bouquets for your subscriptions? Yeah, back when we were growing them, I was um, pretty much primarily just selling to florists. And, you know, as Dave has said so many times in the past, when you expand your horizons of what you're growing, you sell more to the same customer. And that was the case. They, I mean, they bought all the echinacea cones we had. You know, they, yeah. it's something different and unique. And let's face it, they last forever when they're a cone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And you said the vase life is about a week when you're using it for the flower? You get about a week, like like, like you would expect for a cut flower, about a week. And does this tend to be a short-lived plant or a long-lived plant? No, it, it, in the field, um, as long as you're not cutting it down to the ground and leaving nothing to regenerate the root for the next year, it should last you five, six, ten years. It's not something that's going to die out for you fast. Again, as long as you have good drainage in the wintertime. Great. Anything else we should know about echinacea? Really stiff stems. That's the one thing to know. They're yes. just, they're as stiff as a, a straw or a pencil. They don't bend. All right. Now we're going to move on to Echinops, which is also known as globe thistle. And these are these gorgeous, spiky looking spherical globes in these really beautiful steely blue shades. This is absolutely one of my favorite flowers. So why is Echinops worth growing, Dave? Well, like you said, it's a great flower. It's an interesting steel blue color, yeah. which you get again mid to late july is when they bloom um it can be dried although it turns out kind of a darker greenish gray when it dries um, but it's just a great flower to have that texture in a bouquet you know you get that steel blue color and then the texture that's just unique that's really yeah. good and they're really stunning in the landscape too especially with that spherical globe shape against more like daisy like flowers or spikes they just really stand out lisa did you grow echinops I did. And it is super tall. Um, mm -hmm. And our commercial customers, again, just it was that a blue that you yeah. don't often see much less in the middle of summer. And it there, it was just really, really beautiful. And um, but it was prickly. Not prickly bad, not like picking blackberries or something that has a lot of- Not that bad, but it's prickly. But it, if you're in July yeah. clothing, which is usually right. not much because it's <laughs> hot outside, it you it, just have to know that. It's not, It's you can overcome it, but just be aware. Yeah, it's it's not as bad as like the Canadian thistle, but it is a, right. in the thistle family, so to speak, but it's not, not going to chase you out of the garden right. <laughs> that bad. right. <laughs> So what are your favorite varieties, or maybe it's just even the species that you recommend growing for Echinops? Ritro is the only one, yeah. R-I-T. Yeah. I don't know of any others. <laughs> um, yeah. there, is, there is a white one that can be found, um, but most people stick with the blue. It's the best one, just Ritro. Um, the important to know about them is that they don't bloom till the second year. So we talked before the Echinacea is yeah. blooming there. The Echinops doesn't bloom till the second year. So, you know, you don't want to put it out there and start at the spring and then 
you know, by August, you're thinking, why didn't these bloom? And you rip them out because you think they're no good and you did something wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just the kind of perennial that doesn't bloom until the second year. And then they're going to bloom every year after year. Um, and you're happy with them after that. Just don't be disappointed when they don't bloom the first year from seed. And the same thing if you were to buy plugs of them, unless you're buying vernalized plugs that were started the year before, if you buy plugs that were going from seed this spring, they're still not going to bloom to you until the second year. That is the, I remember I started it from seed and I was so disappointed the first summer. It didn't, didn't bloom. I mean, they're lucky I let them live to the next year, but then I was lucky because they bloomed then. <laughs> right, because you were big on growing annuals and you were expecting I want flowers the first year, right? Yeah. And could you overcome that by starting them, getting them in the ground in late summer or fall the year before? Would they then yeah. flower that next year? Yeah, you could do that by starting the seed in July or early August, get them planted out by late September, early October. They'll overwinter and then they'll, they've had that cold vernalization period and they'll bloom for you the, the next spring or actually the next summer, the next year. <clears throat> All right. So what hardiness zones can grow Echinops as a perennial? Um, the Echinops is uh, hardy to zone three to nine. So a little bit colder than the other flowers we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, again, good drainage in the winter is important. And the other thing to know about Echinops is if you don't get all the flowers picked, they will reseed. Um, some people think they become invasive. I never had them get invasive on my farm. You would get you know one or two new plants a year. Um, it was never bad, mainly because I sold all the flowers because you need all the flowers. If you were letting yeah. them go to seed, if you were growing just in your garden as a landscape plant, it might reseed and spread out more than yeah. you want it. Did you notice any reseeding, Lisa, when you were growing? I did not. And I have a question for Dave, um, because that was a long time ago that I grew that. And, you know, I was the person that started it in spring and then thought, what did I do wrong? It didn't bloom that summer. Um, And that was, I bet that was probably the first or second year I was farming. So I really was blindfolded. Um, But do you find it to be a long-lived perennial or is it reseeding? Now, for me, the actual plants did come back every year. Um, you will get some reseeding, but for me, the plants were good. I want to say four or five years, they were still there. And, okay. you know, but again, you can get to the ground. You have to leave some foliage on the plant to regenerate right. roots healthy all summer. You can't harvest everything in the middle of July and cut it to the ground. Right. And what is the proper harvest stage for Echinops to get the longest vase life? Harvest stage is important because it's best to harvest them just as they start to open or even like the day before they start to open because then you're selling more of a globe pin cushion looking thing as opposed to the little flowers. So when the flowers open, they don't last that long, the actual florets on the end of each little spike. So it's best to harvest it before it actually blooms. And that's when it still has almost like a silvery look yes. to it still, not when it's that full blue look that it eventually right. would have. The little flowers are blue, but the I guess it's the seed pod or the, the buds before it open is the, yes. the silvery color. Yes. And mm-hmm. what spacing do you recommend out in the field? And do you have any other growing tips? Yeah. Um, so like most perennials, 12 to 15 inches down the row. Um, you could do a single row if you have that kind of spacing on your farm or your garden. Um, if you're growing just in your garden, you would normally take perennials and put them in groups of three, like a triangle that's like a 15 inches between each leg of the triangle. Um, but for cut flower production, usually the row with them 12 to 15 inches apart down the row and either two or three rows in a bed, depending how wide your bed is. And then you stagger them down the bed. So it's not two or three right next to each other. They're staggered. Right. Is that sound similar to what you did, Lisa? Yeah, I was just trying to think, remember also if that's it's exactly how we planted them. If it was difficult to start from seed, I can't remember. I don't seem, I don't remember having a lot of plants. And I don't know if that was because I didn't start many because I wasn't familiar or if I just didn't have great germination. Do you, have you, when, did you start them from seed or did you get plugs, Dave? I started mine from seed and the germination seemed fine. You know, you'd plant a tray of a hundred and get 75 or 80 plants. I think that's normal. Yeah. So yeah as far as the germination. Um, yeah. I will say too, something that I've done with Echinops is a cold, moist stratification. So what I've done is three or four weeks of stratification just in damp, not wet, but damp paper towels and a little plastic bag in the refrigerator. And they do really well. We get really, really great germination. So if you're struggling with that, I would recommend maybe trying <laughs> a cold, moist stratification to see if that can improve your germination. Right. That's basically the idea of doing the priming of a seed where you, you're waking it up and it's just ready to germinate and sprout. So, yeah, um, a lot of perennials can, are like that because the the seed wants to overwinter in the cold and the damp and then they'll yeah. sprout. Just trying to mimic that. 
And by doing it in the refrigerator with the damp paper towels, what you're doing there. But keep an eye on it because you don't want to have them sprout in the paper towel. Yes. to be doing sprouts because then you've lost them. Yes, you do have to check on them. Yeah. And I also, I sometimes do that with echinacea as well. It's not necessarily required for echinacea purpurea, but sometimes it can still improve germination. And it does seem to be required for some of the other species of echinacea that I grow. You do that and just, you'll see the seed gets bigger and it's puffy and it's gotten fat and then it's ready to go ahead and plant it. Oh yes. Yes. And what is the vase life like for Echinops? Uh, well, if you pick it before it's actually bloomed, it's going to last you two or three weeks because it's basically oh. a seed by bud. It's not seed powder, but it's buds. Once it starts to open, you got the little teeny blue florets uh, a week. And even some of those might dry up on it, but you don't notice it because the flowers themselves are really small. Um, you know, there may be an eighth of an yes. inch of little flowers. Yes. And you touched on this before, but does it work well as a dried flower? You can dry them, yes. You would preferably dry it before they open or wait till the flowers are, are dead on the plant and then dry the what becomes a seed pod. But yeah, they can be dry. Anything else you think we should know about Echinops? Um, like Lisa says, they have a little bit of a thorn, but it's not like a uh, a needle thorn. It's more like just a... I don't know, prickly. It's prickly, yes, yeah, prickly, but not bad. And actually the flower heads themselves aren't the prickly part. It's along the stems with little small like a really gentle thistle, I like to call it. <laughs> it wasn't. <big. laughs> I think I remember the foliage seemed to be yeah. a little prickly, and but that flower makes you keep coming back and going in for more. Just the, the color and the, the shape and the texture of the flower is yeah. great. Yeah. It's worth the wait to start the seed and get the flowers next year. Or if in the springtime you can get or order the year before some vernalized plugs, which are basically where the plug grower started in the year before and they gave them the one winter of cold. Then you plant them in the spring and they'll bloom for you that first year. Perfect. Okay, so next we're going to talk about yarrow, or some people pronounce it yarrow. And this has really fern-like foliage and these clusters of tiny little florets at the top of each stem. It's so pretty. And there are a lot of really nice mixes available to give you some variety in terms of color. So why is yarrow worth growing, Dave? Um, it's a great bouquet filler flower. And blooms in actually early summer, the second year it's growing. The very first year it blooms a little bit later because you started from seed. Um, it's a good color, good filler flower and comes in interesting colors. Um, usually there's one called Colorado mix and one is summer pastels or summer berries. Yes. It's soft muted colors. Um, there are some that are brighter. There's one called paprika. That's a much brighter kind of intense red. Um, just lots of different colors. And the fact that it makes a great filler flower um, and the plants do spread and get big fast, <laughs> not invasive, but you know, you plant 10 plants and in a couple of years, you can have lots of flowers off of them. Yes. And Lisa, this is one you still grow. You grow it as an annual though, right? Yeah. The Colorado sunset is kind of our favorite yarrow. And it's for some of those unusual colors that there's like a shrimp and a really soft, I call it baby yellow. It's that yes. real light yellow and we don't get it to come back. I mean, it the, the white and the pale pink just tend to overpower the reseeding process. Mm -hmm. So we replant every fall. So we keep getting those really, really unique colors because we just love them. One interesting thing, if, if you've got an area where you do get them to overwinter well, is if you find a certain color you like, you can dig that plant up and divide it and spread it out. And because and, oh, yeah. you get roots. So you can, if you find that one color that you really like, you can then propagate that by dig digging them and dividing the roots and spreading it out. There you go. Yeah, that's a really something all the time. And are they first year flowering? Yes, they are first year flowering. Um, you start them in early spring and they'll be flowering for you. Like I said, the first year, a little bit later than normal, maybe sometime in July. Um, but in future years, they should be blooming for you in early to mid June. So it's yeah. a fairly early blooming perennial. Yes. So which hardiness zones can grow yarrow as a perennial? Yeah, the yarrow is a pretty hardy plant. It can go down to zone three, so three to nine, um, especially if you consider this one called Colorado mix. I would hope that came from Colorado, which gets pretty cold in the wintertime. Oh, is that why it's called that? I always wonder. I always guess that's why, because there are, where I'm at in the mid-Atlantic, there's a wild one that's white and, you know, so it grows wild here and it's been around forever. I'm pretty sure it's a, a native flower, so. So what spacing do you recommend in the field? And are there any special tips for growing yarrow? Okay. With each yarrow, the ones that are grown from seed are a little bit different because they do creep. They're not like the um, echinacea that stays more as a, a clump flower. So if you can put them 12 inches, then after a few years, you're gonna have a solid mass of flowers. 
Now I've had some people before planted, especially if you do a landscape, and it gets to be you know, a five foot diameter circle of plant that starts to die out in the middle. So sometimes the older plants that might be four or five years old do die out. But if you planted you know, two rows in a three foot bed, it's gonna creep and fill that bed. You might have a few empty spots, but you're still gonna get a lot of flowers out of it because it does creep as it spreads. Yes. What spacing do you do, Lisa? We do, because we do grow them as annuals, we grow four rows, six inches apart in the row in a 30 inch wide bed. Yeah. You're not letting them just spread and come back the next year. It's a one. Correct. Correct. All right. And what is the proper harvest stage for yarrow? Uh, Way open. Don't harvest them too soon. They're going to wilt just by looking at them. Um, You definitely, (laughs) the little florets open, a little side bud should be opening. Um, Definitely be totally open when you pick them, not just starting to open. Like a lot of cut flowers you pick when they're just starting to open does not work with these yarrow because they'll just droop in the bucket before you pick the next step. And what is the vase life when you pick at the proper stage, would you say? Long time. A a good week. (laughs) Yeah. And does it work well as a dried flower? I know there's a variety called Coronation Gold that really holds its color really, really well. That's actually a different species than the varieties we've been talking about. We've been talking about a lot of Achillea millifolium varieties today, like Colorado mix, summer berries, summer pastels. Do any of those varieties dry well? There's other varieties that do, like the Coronation Gold and Moonshine. And those are a a different type, really stiff stem grown from cut seed propagation is by cuttings or division. Um, these don't dry that well because they tend to shrivel up. Yeah. All right. Anything else you think we should know about yarrow? Um, nothing other than the fact that the scientific name is Achillea. And then I, I just mentioned that there's the coronation gold and the uh, moonshine, which is not when you would start from seed. You might think, oh, I want to grow that yellow one from seed. You're not going to be able to. It's only done from cuttings and uh, division. That's a really good point. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our episode for today. So thank you so much for watching. And thank you so much, Dave, for joining us. We always love when you're on here. And don't forget everyone to leave us a rating or review. Make sure to follow or subscribe and give us a like and a comment, including what we should name the koala bear. (laughs) So thank you so much, everybody. (laughs) Thank you, folks. And remember, if you want to learn more about the work that we're doing at the Gardener's Workshop, head on over to our website. We'll put down in the show notes a link as well as a link directly to Dave's class. Um, And I think you've learned here today that Dave's just a walking encyclopedia. You can ask him about any flower and any application and he will either know the answer or direct you to where to get it. And we just love him being a part of our family. And um, thanks, Dave and friends. Until we meet again, bye Lane, bye Dave. Bye-bye, Lisa and Lane.